Today I'm out near Park City, Utah for one of the most important product launches in Cadillac's long history. This is the all new Cadillac Lyric. A lot is riding on this model, not just because Cadillac has said that their future is all electric, and this really gives us an idea of what that future is going to look like, but because General Motors more broadly has said their future is all electric, and again, this gives us a window into that electric future. So it's a pretty good thing that I think this is the best Cadillac that they've ever built. As you approach the new Lyric, the first thing you're going to notice is this very distinctive front end. It's instantly recognizable as a Cadillac, yet still distinctly modern. They decided to give it sort of a grill motif, I guess you could say. This is more of a shield, I guess, because no cooling happens here. All the cooling is just down there at the very bottom of the bumper. But instead of just making this a blank face theme or just an imitation grill, they've added light modules inside this grill. And what's really unique about this is that each of these lines that you see on the outside, sort of this smiley face portion of this shield, can be lit independently of one another. And that gives us a really interesting light show as you approach the vehicle at night. It may not look like it, but the new Lyric is kind of sort of the cousin of the Hummer truck and the Hummer SUV. You might be wondering, how is this possible? Well, General Motors is calling both of them Ultium platform vehicles, but Ultium platform doesn't mean the same thing that platform sharing used to mean within the General Motors umbrella. The reason is that they're not talking about front suspension or rear suspension or necessarily even crash structure sharing. Ultium platform sharing mainly seems to have to do with the motor unit design, but not the motor units themselves, and the battery pack design, but not the entire battery pack itself. The modules are, however, common. So this vehicle has a 12-module battery pack versus the 24-module battery pack that we currently find in the Hummer truck and the Hummer SUV. That battery pack is positioned low in the vehicle. It's not a true skateboard platform because that would actually be a little bit less efficient than this. You can think of this sort of as a battery in-body design. The battery is a separate component from the body where the suspension and everything else mounts to, but the body is responsible for adding extra structure to the vehicle. So if you removed the battery, this vehicle would still roll down the road, but it wouldn't be quite as rigid as if it had the battery pack in place. Now, exactly how much of the Lyric is going to be shared with other General Motors EVs in the future, we don't know precisely, but we do know that the motor module in the back of this vehicle is going to be used in the upcoming Chevy truck. But obviously the Chevy truck is not gonna share much else with a luxury SUV like this. Battery pack modules, motor modules, those are definitely going to be shared, but the rest of the structure of the vehicle is uniquely Cadillac. Now, in terms of dimension, this is about the same size as the BMW iX and the Audi e-tron. It has a bit more of a sport back vibe, so I guess you could say e-tron sport back, and honestly a bit of a luxury SUV station wagon vibe I guess you could say as well. It has a pretty high belt line as you'd expect in a modern luxury crossover, reasonable ground clearance down there, but we have a very rear wheel drive proportion with that long hood up front, long dash to axle ratio, and then a relatively low roof line. As you'd expect in a luxury performance crossover, we have wide tires and big wheels. These are the optional 22 inch wheels and 275 width tires. The standard tire size of this vehicle is a 265 width tire, so significantly wider than something like a Ford Mustang Mach-E. Now, I wouldn't normally talk about a Ford versus a Cadillac specifically, but the two vehicles actually have some overlap in pricing. If you're taking a look at, for instance, something like the Mach-E GT performance trim, that's actually gonna be a bit more expensive than the base version of the Cadillac Lyric but this is going to be a more appropriate competitor to something like the new Mercedes-Benz EQE, the BMW iX, the Audi e-tron, etc. And yes, of course, the Tesla Model Y. We can't talk about an electric crossover without talking about that Tesla because it is the best-selling EV currently in America. Now, Cadillac has said that they did not design this as a direct competitor to the Model Y, and that sort of makes sense because EV adoption rates in the US aren't actually that high, so there's a lot of white space out there to convince potential shoppers that maybe this format of crossover is better for you than what Tesla has created in the Model Y. Now, the general design of this is certainly more style forward, in my opinion, than the Model Y. Lots of swoops, lots of angles, lots of LED light show going on on the outside. And the Model Y in comparison honestly looks kind of plain. Dimensionally, the Model Y is a little bit shorter than this, but it does have an available third row, which you won't find in the Lyric. Now, honestly, that third row in the Model Y is pretty darn small. There's not a lot of cargo space behind it, but if you're looking for a vehicle in this category, more or less, that has a back row, you will find one in the Model Y. 
As you'd expect in a modern EV, there is a lot of attention to aerodynamic detail. That's why we have the spoiler there, why we have another little lip spoiler right there on top of the hatch, and why we have these very 3D tail lap modules and this wraparound design that goes from the side on over to the back. All around the Lyric, there are a number of really cool lighting touches, like these very 3D tail lamp modules. We have a vertical stripe over here on this side, and then you can see through these little windows right there from one side of the vehicle to the other. Again, this is the brake light, but it will also blink with the turn signal. As with other modern EVs, you can get your Lyric with either one motor or with two. If you get the single motor model, it's rear wheel drive, giving you 340 horsepower total. The dual motor model bumps that up to 500 horsepower, but we don't have official torque or range figures for that model just yet. This one will give you 312 miles of EPA range. I expect the all wheel drive model is probably going to come in between 270 and 280 miles of range. Both models share the exact same 102 kilowatt hour battery pack, and that battery pack is really the basis of the Ultium platform, I guess you could say. The battery pack and the way the pack and everything ties together in the vehicle is the core of that architecture. This has a 12 module battery pack as I said before, but the modules are directly interchangeable with the Hummer EV or the Hummer SUV. Now the interesting twist with the Ultium platform is that the voltage of the battery pack is dependent on the number of battery modules it has. So this is a 12 module vehicle, meaning it has a 400 volt nominal or so battery pack in it. It's not an 800 volt capable vehicle like the Hummer is because it has half the number of batteries. And that's the big reason that this battery pack is not going to charge as quickly as the battery pack in the Hummer EV. That one will charge at around 350 kW if you can find a charging station that actually supports that. This one's going to top out at around 190 kW. That's probably okay because this battery pack is a lot smaller than the one in the Hummer. And actually 190 kW, as long as it is sustained for a long enough time, is a pretty decent charge curve. I haven't been able to DC fast charge this yet. Wait for that video that's coming up soon. But according to Cadillac, this could gain about 76 miles of range in 10 minutes. Aside from having a modular battery pack, the Lyric has a few extra tricks up its sleeve. This has an onboard heat pump standard in all models. In fact, General Motors has said that all Ultium family vehicles will have a heat pump standard. You don't have to jump up into the all-wheel drive model in order to get that range-saving feature. One of the benefits of this heat pump system, however, that's a little bit different than some of the competition, is that it can scavenge heat from wherever it needs. So it can actually move heat from the electric motors into the battery pack, vice versa. It can move heat from the cabin into the battery pack or to the electric motors. It does support battery preconditioning, although we don't have all the details just yet about that functionality. We also don't have quite all the details about the thermal storage capability of the battery pack, but this sounds really cool. One of the things that Cadillac said that this vehicle is capable of is if you're charging at home, it can actually heat the battery pack, keep it at a nice high toasty temperature for optimal charging. But then when you drive off in the morning on a cool day, the battery pack doesn't need to be at that temperature. So it can then shuttle the heat from the battery pack into the cabin to heat the cabin rather than simply heating outside air. So that really drastically improves the efficiency of this vehicle if you have that ability Ability to start warm. No pun intended, but another really cool thing about this heating and cooling system is that it is incredibly quiet. The Lyric has been on this entire time, and the AC on the inside is set to 60 degrees because it's kind of hot out here, and you can barely hear the fan on the outside running. They've done an admirable job not only quieting the cabin, but making the entire experience very premium with the Lyric. Now, charging happens right here behind power door number one. This is where we find the J1772 connector and the DC fast charge connector as well. This is vaguely reminiscent of what we find in the Audi e-tron. Now, charging rates, this is kind of an interesting twist. There is an included 7.7 kW EVSE with the vehicle. I suspect a lot of folks will be able to live their entire life with just that charge rate. I generally end up charging my EVs at a rate of about 3.3 to 6 kW, depending on where I am. If you get the rear wheel drive model, there is an onboard 19.2 kW EVSE, and you'll be able to install one of those in your home and get this from zero to completely full in about five and a half to six hours. But right now, if you choose the all wheel drive model, we get a slower onboard charger. It's just an 11.5 kW unit. Now, Cadillac was a little bit cagey about all the details, but they said that the basic reason that the all-wheel drive model doesn't get the faster charger on board is that it was rushed into production. They really wanted to get the all-wheel drive model out ASAP because there's such a lot of customer demand for it that they decided to make a few concessions. And in the future, the all-wheel drive model may have the 19.2 kW charger. If you're interested in that and you're interested in all-wheel drive, you might want to wait. We don't know exactly when in 2024 that might happen or if it's going to be a little bit later than that, but they have said it definitely is in the cards. 
you might also want to wait for the all-wheel drive model if you're interested in towing. The tow rating on the Lyric is not going to be terribly high. If you want a higher tow rating, there will be additional Ultium family vehicles with higher tow ratings, but the all-wheel drive model is going to be the one with rated towing capacity. The rear-wheel drive model has a towing capacity of zero. With such a long hood and rear-wheel drive, you might be wondering what's going on under the hood. Well, under the hood, we have this plastic panel and then no storage area. But very clearly, Cadillac could have given us something. And I admit to being a little bit disappointed by that. Now, obviously, in the all-wheel drive model, there's probably not going to be a lot of room swimming around down here. But I wish they had given us at least somewhere to put the portable EVSE or maybe a Tesla tap, something like that. Just any tiny amount of space really would have been appreciated. Instead, in this model, we find some of the electronic control systems, the charger, the inverter, etc. We also find the 12 volt battery pack and of course, all the plumbing required for that heat pump system. No EV would be complete without aerodynamic door handles. So let's go over the ones in the Lyric. This is just a button. It is a physical button. You can see it moves right there. And then you open the door on the front with this little pull tab. This is vaguely reminiscent of what we see in the Mustang Mach-E for the same aerodynamic reason. But I did find it a little bit unusual to press this first and then have to move your hand up here to then grab the door and open it. In the back, we find the same button, but no vestigial handle on top. Instead, basically the same thing as the Mach-E again, we have a little rubber section right here on the back of the door, so you grab the door itself. To open the hatch, we press the Cadillac logo. And to open the hood, we have a double pull lever since there's no storage up front. Sorry about the dashboard chime going off. I couldn't find a way to turn it off, but still keep the cabin cool while I was filming. Front seat comfort was exceptional over a day in this Cadillac. That's long been something that we've seen from Cadillac in their crossovers and SUVs for a while. And the front seats are a little bit wider than I had expected. That was made possible by moving the seat controls over to the front doors. Rather than having to grab down here on the side of the seat, they were able to make the cushion a little bit wider and make the door storage pockets wider as well. In addition to the multi-way power driver's seat with four-way lumbar, we have a powered tilt telescopic memory linked steering wheel and front seat massage for the driver and front passenger. At least for the moment, the Lyric is going to come only one way, basically fully loaded. At the moment, that means that all models have this large panoramic moonroof, but it is closable with the shade, and I still have a reasonable amount of headroom here. With my head all the way back to this headrest, I have about three and a half inches left. Jumping into the back seat, the Lyric definitely has a big and spacious feel. The back seat is certainly wider across the back than something like the Genesis GV60, but we get about the same kind of combined legroom, 81 inches front row plus second row. Although I wouldn't be surprised if GM's legroom numbers maybe get revised a little bit later because this certainly feels roomier than the GV60. The distance between my bottom right here on the seat back cushion and that dashboard, that's a really long distance, but I think it's just because the Lyric is more relaxed, more reclined in its seating position, so a little bit more more like perhaps a classic Cadillac than you might expect. It's not as upright as an Escalade or an XT4 or XT5, and I kind of like that vibe. We have a nearly flat load floor in this vehicle. Moving over to the middle of the rear bench, you'll definitely notice the extra width versus something like the Genesis GV60. Headroom is a little bit lower than I had expected. If I put my head back to the headrest, my hair is just barely brushing the ceiling, but headroom's still fairly generous. Not quite as much as you'd find in something like a BMW X5, of course. Moving all the way over to the right side, this front seat's all the way back in its tracks. You can see I still have about an inch and a half of legroom left. The rear seats do offer a little bit of recline. There is a lever right here. You can put them in a more upright position for extra cargo practicality or a little bit of recline, about three quarters of an inch of motion. But if you do that, then my head does touch the ceiling. Rear seat passengers get air vents in the center console. They've said that there may be a three zone climate control coming soon with controls in that little blank space. We have USB-C charge ports, a 120 volt power inverter. You can see that nearly flat floor there and the ISO fix or latch anchors right here. These are a little bit on the large side and you will notice them sitting in the back seat. I also wouldn't be surprised if I saw a revision of the cargo area numbers in the Lyric because this cargo area seems more spacious than the one that we find in the EV6 or the GV60 or the Ionic 5, but on the sheet, it's 28 cubic feet, so pretty similar to most EVs out there. This does, again, feel a little bit bigger, however, and there's plenty of room for roller luggage. It's possible that Cadillac may be using a different standard for measuring cargo capacity because there's also a cargo well right there under the load floor and a place to store the roller cargo cover. If you want to know about the interior of the Lyric in great detail, there is a separate video on the channel where I take a deep, deep dive into the various components in here because this is an all new interior for Cadillac, including lots of new interior components like a new steering wheel, new shifters, etc. But the big feature in here is this approximately 33 inch curved LCD in the dashboard. I mistakenly said it was an OLED display. Apparently Cadillac has clarified and they have said that it is a close bonded LCD, not an OLED. But again, if you want to know more about that, be sure and check out that video. Back to the nav system, let's talk about navigation routing. 
You can see it supports natural voice commands. Let's see how this goes. San Jose, California pulled it right up there. It's going to load the route, then it's going to tell me I need to charge. Let's see how this goes. Uh, see, so add charging stops. Oh, aren't enough compatible charging stations to get to your destination. That is something that I noticed a little bit earlier, but you should keep in mind that this vehicle has a very, very early software build, and it's actually not even the version that you're going to get if you were to buy one right now or pick yours up soon. Uh, there are a number of quirks because this is a very, very early pre-production vehicle. Hopefully that's something they fix, but we won't know till I get this at home to do a more complete test. We still have a power button over here, so this is a bit more traditional, and I honestly like that. I like being able to turn the vehicle on and off. I don't want it to do that for me, but that's just a personal preference. Here we have a small storage bin lined in blue imitation leather. There's also a storage bin right underneath it, but I can't open it. They say that that is not ready for production yet. Uh, that will be in the final production models. I'm just not able to sample that. Below that, we have a single USB port right there across that trim strip that says Cadillac and then blue accents down there in that large storage bin. Thanks to the very flat floor, we're able to have the sort of diving board style center console here, and then lots of storage in the middle of the vehicle. Interesting twist, there's also an additional USB port right there in case you're wondering. We have two large cup holders, the controller for that infotainment and navigation system. Cadillac has said that their customers actually like this, so they decided to give us both methods. I'm surprised actually, because I much prefer the touchscreen. Let me know what you think. And I would say that this software, I think, is a little bit better optimized for touchscreen integration, but does work fairly well with that rotary controller. Between the front seats, we have a pretty large storage area with yet another USB-C port. One nice touch is that any of these USB ports can be used to integrate with CarPlay, or you can go wireless if you want to, and we have a wireless charger slot right there that is able to charge my iPhone through that case. That's pretty rare. Bearing in mind that the instrument cluster software is not quite complete in this particular pre-production trim, it is adjustable via the options over here on this touchscreen side. So I can choose between three different layouts, or I guess four different layouts actually right there. So there's a full map view based on the same Google mapping interface as the infotainment system. There's also a clean view, but personally, I prefer the energy view. We also, on this little touchscreen over here on this side, get features like the trip computer readouts, and then of course, headlight controls as well. To free up space in the center console, Cadillac has gone back to a column mounted shifter. So you pull towards the driver and then push up for reverse, pull towards the driver and then down for drive. You can see they're illuminated. And then park is this button right over here on the end of the stock. As is the three spoke steering wheel with capacitive controls. You'll notice the eye monitor right there just behind the steering wheel. That's for the Super Cruise system that is standard on this vehicle, although the software is not going to be available right at launch. So if you do get your Lyric in 2022, the software to enable Super Cruise, that's coming a little bit later. Now, the capacitive controls do not respond if you're just casually running your finger over. You have to have a definite dedicated press to them, and then there's haptic feedback so you know what you're doing. On the left side of the wheel, we have controls for the infotainment system as well as this little toggle that allows you to change tracks, change sources, etc. And then on the left side, we have the controls for the standard radar adaptive cruise control system and of course the button to enable and disable Super Cruise. To the left of the steering wheel, we have some more unique buttons, the electric parking brake, lane keeping assistance, auto brake hold, and then the dimmer. And then of course, as expected, unique window switches and mirror controls. Starting out on this gravel road, the first thing you're gonna notice about the Lyric is the ride quality. This is very, very different from a Tesla Model 3 or a Tesla Model Y. In terms of ride quality, this is more similar to the expensive Teslas in the United States, the Model S and the Model X. Now, interestingly, Cadillac chose not to give the Lyric an adaptive suspension system. I wouldn't be surprised if that came a little bit later, but they did give this a multi-link, basically an almost double wishbone suspension up front and a five link suspension in the rear. So the suspension motions are very well controlled. And you'll really notice that out here on rough pavement or washboard pavement in the corners, that the suspension never becomes upset. This always has an exceptional level of poise, I have to say. This comes across as you might think a modern Cadillac should and rides very differently than X-T4 and X-T5, which I find a little bit on the firm side and uh, definitely more composed than the Cadillac Escalade. This might actually be the best riding Cadillac crossover. The extra curb weight in the Lyric is certainly noticeable. This has a larger, heavier feel out on the road that personally I like, but you will notice that acceleration times and braking distances are going to be faster and shorter respectively in some of the lighter weight competition, most notably that Genesis GV60. It is pretty darn swift. It won't go as far as this on a charge. Its battery is smaller, but it is significantly lighter than this. The BMW iX also has some impressive numbers, but it's quite a lot more expensive than this. It's made of carbon fiber that really helps its curb weight profile, but it also means that it's about $40,000 more than 
this Cadillac Lyric. So I think the Cadillac really hit the right balance with this model. Now in terms of my preliminary 0 to 60 numbers, this model managed 6.0 seconds 0 to 60, so definitely slower than some of those competitors, even though we have a bit more horsepower out of the electric motor. That simply has to do with the curb weight. I was not able to do any 60 to 0 braking testing, but I suspect this is probably going to be around 118 to 120 feet or so, probably a little bit longer than some of those lighter weight competitors. Although Cadillac does give this really wide tires. 265 width tires are standard, 275 width tires are optional. This one has the wider tire package on it and the lower profile tires. And those low profile tires, they really aren't a problem. The ride quality is still pretty darn good. The Lyric really comes across as the ultimate highway cruiser. The ride is smooth and the ride is serene. This cabin is very, very quiet. Again, the car was on this entire time and you could hear that the HVAC system wasn't making much noise outside. It's not really making much noise inside, although a bit more noise is generally picked up by these mics than you'll really hear in person. I would not be surprised if this was one of the quietest cabins that we've ever tested once I get this back at home. Road noise and wind noise are incredibly well controlled and you don't get the sort of rumble that you sometimes can in EVs. Also, you don't really get any electric motor whine in here, which is certainly something that you can get in pretty much every other modern EV out there. You'll get at least some of it. Now there is some fake noise piped in here if you want to. If I put this in tour mode and then floor it, then you get some imitation noise piped in through the speaker systems, but the motors themselves are very, very quiet. And you'll really notice that when you're regenerative braking. Regenerative braking is normally a bit louder in terms of motor noise. We see that in a lot of other EVs, but in this vehicle, it is very, very quiet. You really don't get any sound from that electric motor in the back. We should talk about regen braking here a little bit. This has a blended braking system, meaning that when you put your foot on the brake pedal, it's going to start regenerating power up to the point where the battery can no longer accept more power. The motor can no longer generate more power. Then it's going to start feathering in the friction brakes. You can also command regenerative braking with this paddle on the back of the steering wheel, it is a variable paddle. It's not an on-off paddle like we find in the Bolt and the Bolt EUV. So if you pull it very gently and very slightly, it's going to give you very gentle regen braking. You pull it more aggressively, it's going to max out the regen. So if you want to be sure that the friction brakes aren't engaging, you can just crank on that pedal, get the maximum in regen braking. Now, if you want one pedal driving, this has that mode as well. You can turn it on and off in the instrument cluster or instrument panel right there. Uh, but personally, I'm not the biggest fan of one pedal driving. I think it's a lot smoother just to use the blended braking system. One pedal driving in most EVs has always struck me as a solution in search of a problem because these vehicles don't have the same problem, I guess you could say, that Teslas do and the reason that Tesla chose not to use a blended braking system. Blended braking is expensive to get right. And rather than try and get it right or try and license patents from other car manufacturers, Tesla decided just to not bother. So they end up effectively leaving electrons on the table. A modern Tesla cannot regenerate as much power back into the battery as a vehicle like this. This is much more aggressive in its maximum regen ability than a modern Tesla. But a Tesla has very consistent brake feel, very pure brake feel, I guess you could say, because when you put your foot on the brake pedal, all you're getting is the friction brakes. And that's the big reason that Tesla decided to do one pedal driving, because when you lift your foot off the accelerator pedal, that throttle lift off regen, that's all the regen you get. In this, that is not the case. You have a few more options. And those options include features like choosing auto brake hold or not. If you want the kind of creep that you get in a regular gasoline vehicle, you can have that. If you want the vehicle to just stop and stay there, you can have that. If you want metal one pedal driving, you can get that. If you want this variable paddle on the back of the steering wheel, you can get that as well. And you can also vary the throttle response and the amount of throttle liftoff regen braking you get by the various drive modes in the instrument cluster. That's the one thing that I like about most modern EVs out there is that they give us a bit more choice than we find within the Tesla envelope. But as with every decision in life, there are pros and cons. And the con to this kind of setup with blended braking is that the brake pedal feel is not quite as normal. So you'll really notice that if I move over here in this lane where there's nobody behind me and I brake moderately and then transition to more aggressive braking, there can be just a slight moment of disconnect or a, brake or a friction braking engagement that feels just a little bit less polished. Now, it's really, really well done. This is one of the best blended braking systems that I've ever interacted with, but that difference is still there. So if you're interested in the purity of braking feel, you'll find that in a Tesla. If you're interested in options, you'll find that in the Cadillac. When it comes to handling, you're certainly gonna notice the added heft in the Lyric, but Cadillac has done an excellent job tuning the suspension. 
As you might expect in a modern electric vehicle, this has a near perfect 50-50 weight balance. And although they weren't overly specific about the rear wheel drive model, I suspect this might actually be just a tiny bit lighter up front than in the rear, just as you find in say a rear wheel drive BMW 3 Series, or interestingly, a rear wheel drive Cadillac as well. That leads to an excellent steering feel out on your favorite winding mountain road. Now I wasn't able to film any of that, but I was able to spend a little bit of time out on some windier roads out here in Utah. It definitely has a good feel to it but it also feels a little bit on the heavy side. The suspension does not get upset over broken pavement or uh, sections of pavement where there's gravel or sand on the road. It has a really good composure to it, but it's not gonna cut that corner as tightly as something that's a little bit lighter or something that's dual motor because you might be able to get that front motor to help you around the corner in some situations. This is always gonna have a strong rear power bias because in this model, that's the only place where the power happens. Now, if you're debating between the single motor version and the dual motor version, you should know that regen braking is likely going to be a little bit uh, more sorted, I guess you'd say, in slippery conditions, ice, snow, etc. if you get the dual motor model, because in this model, only the rear motor is doing that regen braking, and regen braking can get pretty aggressive. I noticed that out on some of those winding mountain roads going down, that if you really cranked on this regen paddle on the back of the steering wheel hard, that the rear wheels, they kind of start to lose traction in the reverse fashion, I guess you could say, and that ends up in the vehicle having to engage the front brakes. And because of the way that's happening, there can be just a moment of disconnect where it may feel a little bit disconcerting, but then the car takes over and the traction stability control take over, etc. I would not be surprised if the dual motor version did not have that because that's basically what we see in other rear wheel drive or dual motor EVs out there. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to do much as far as efficiency testing out here in Park City because I've been doing a lot of mountain climbing and mountain pass driving. But over the day, I have been averaging three miles per kilowatt hour, which is significantly better than I had honestly expected in this vehicle. That puts the real world range figure, at least out here so far in Park City, at around 300 miles of real world range. If you lived in an area with uh, level road surfaces where you're perhaps going a little bit slower or not spending as much time idling with the air conditioning on, then you would probably be getting closer to that 312 miles of range. Even now with the battery just barely over 50%, the range guessometer is guessing about 173 miles. That sounds pretty plausible. As always, General Motors will not talk about whether or not they have elected a voluntary reduction on the fuel economy figures with this vehicle. I would not be surprised if they at least weren't terribly aggressive at chasing the maximum fuel economy figures. But I am surprised that there is no seeming difference between the 265 with tires and the 275 with tires that are optional on this vehicle. I will have to test that in the real world. I would expect the base model with the slightly narrower tires to give you just a hair better range, but it's possible that both vehicles will come in right there around 312 miles. At least for the moment, summing up the Lyric is pretty easy. If you're looking for an EV that's a bit more relaxed, more luxurious, a little bit more polished in terms of its ride quality, that's why you might want to consider the Lyric. The seating position is a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more Cadillac sedan-like, whereas the ride height of the vehicle is a little bit more Cadillac crossover-like, perhaps along the lines of the X-T5. The result is that I feel a little bit lower in here with a slightly higher sill height than you'd expect in an X-T5, but definitely higher off the ground than you'd find in a CT4 or CT5. Whether or not that's a pro or con will really depend on what you're looking for in your next EV. I've always been partial to big luxury sedans, and the Lyric definitely has a bit of that large luxury sedan vibe going on here, but some of the higher height nature that some people want in a modern crossover. So perhaps this is one of the truer crossovers out there in terms of that blend of different driving positions. Also, if you're looking for an EV with actual hands-free driving capability, this is going to be the absolute best out there. Now, Full disclosure, I have not been able to drive Super Cruise with this particular model. It's not enabled yet, the software is not ready, but I have Super Cruised in every other General Motors product that it's available in, and this is gonna get the absolute latest version of Super Cruise. What's unique about Super Cruise is that it's an eyes on the road, hands off the steering wheel assist system. So definitely different than autopilot or most of the other luxury systems that we see out there, where you're supposed to still have your hands on the steering wheel at all times, even though yes, you can take your hands off for a short while, they're designed for your hands on the wheel. This is designed for your hands to be off the steering wheel. Now that is similar to what we find in the Ford Mustang Mach-E, but let's be honest, 
Super Cruise is definitely more advanced than the Blue Cruise system. Not only will this change lanes for you, it will actually seek out that lane change, complete the lane change with your hands still off the steering wheel, but it also is better at telling the driver what's going on with this light bar on the top of the steering wheel. That's really the best feature of Super Cruise. You can tell what the system is doing. It's more aggressive and smoother at staying in the lane line. It's just a better system, generally speaking. On the other hand, if you're looking for the most dynamic, sportiest EV, that's not necessarily going to be the Lyric at this moment, but who knows, it could be the Lyric in the future. If you're looking to get your hands on the new Lyric, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that the Lyric is incredibly well-priced, and surprisingly so. The X-T4, the X-T5, and the X-T6, I don't think they're terribly great value in their segments at MSRP. They're a little bit expensive for my tastes. But this Lyric, it's shockingly inexpensive, really, for what you get. At the moment, the Lyric comes only one way. Basically fully loaded, you can choose your wheels and you can choose your tires, but aside from that, it's really just color on the outside and on the inside. That means that the complete bevy of active safety systems is standard, Super Cruise is standard, the big panoramic moonroof is standard, the ginormous LCD on the dashboard, that's also standard. And that standard price tag for 2023 is just under $60,000. And even fully loaded, the Lyric ends up right around $65,000 or so. Now, for the bad news, that's 2023, and all of them are sold. If you pre-order one today, you're pre-ordering a 2024 Lyric. That model, we don't have complete detailed pricing on just yet. Now, that one's going to be available rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. There are likely going to be a few more options than you'll be able to get on the 2023 vehicle if you've already ordered one, but it's going to be substantially the same vehicle. According to Cadillac's pricing direction, the base model is going to start around $60,000 and the all-wheel drive model around $64,000, so a little bit more expensive than 2023, but certainly less expensive than a wide variety of the competition. Whether you're thinking of the Tesla Model Y or the e-tron or the upcoming Mercedes-Benz electric SUVs or the BMW iX. The BMW iX, it's pretty darn expensive compared to this. And I think this interior is better than the interior that we find in the BMW. I also think this interior is better than the interior in the Model Y, which is more expensive. And of course they have an e-tron, which is, yes, you guessed it, more expensive. Bottom line, whether you're looking at a luxury crossover or a mainstream crossover, I think that the Lyric should be on your shopping list because price tag wise, this actually starts right around where an EV6 from Kia ends off. That's how shocking the price tag is on the Lyric. And again, if you're leasing the vehicle, then the tax credit is not gonna be important to you. But if you are buying it, then those mainstream options from companies like Kia, from Hyundai, from Genesis, et cetera, they're likely still going to have the tax credit and that will make them less expensive than this. Now, a Ford Mustang Mach-E, it's gonna run out of its tax credit by the time you would get your hands on one, so it's gonna be in kind of the same boat as this Lyric, but this interior is much more premium and the ride quality and handling ability significantly better than what we find in the Mustang Mach-E. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below, and are you interested in getting your hands on the Lyric? The one fly in the ointment for this vehicle for me is its availability. Cadillac won't say how many they can build, how many they're planning on building, when we'll be able to get some of that information. So this may just be 5,600 pounds of unobtainium because you might not be able to find one, even though this is arguably the best Cadillac that they have ever built. I have a few quibbles about the interior. I think that the air vent in the middle could be done a little bit better. I think that uh, the air vents in the back seat could be a little bit larger. The back seats with the latch anchors on your rear end, those might be a bit more comfortable, and I wouldn't mind a stitched dashboard, something like that, in a higher price model but these are very minor complaints for an absolutely excellent EV. Let me know what you think about all that. Hit the subscribe button, find me over at Alex and Auto's Instagram, Twitter, all those other social places. I'll see all of you next week.